Two kinds of history. This is a lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, for the One School for All module at S4 University College, which I want my wonderful students to watch by the 21st of September when we meet. And we will be talking about history in class, and the, um, we will be talking both about history and theory, so those things two together. And of course, I'm not trying to um, be exhaustive about this. Obviously, there are lots of different kinds of history. Um, but for our case, I, I want us to be able to talk a little bit about individuals, the history of individuals, but also the history of um, politics and more specifically, executive and governmental techniques. So let's get going. Um, the first is the individuals. And we've been talking about the historical span of the 1700s and the 1800s quite a lot. Uh, in, and sure enough, um, in, in that period of time, individual practices or practices of the individual um, developed enormously. The typical example is, of course, psychiatry, as uh, Billy and Giles are demonstrating here. Um, uh, and it's not that Freud suddenly invented the couch or anything, but um, towards the end of the 1800s, uh, Sigmund Freud um, is, is famous for having developed um, psychoanalysis, talking about the geography of our thoughts. Um, but he was also, especially in his early works, really interested in neurology, the geography of the, of the organ of the brain. Um, both those things developed enormously in the 18, 1800s and right right from the beginning of the 1800s um, where it, where people were already discussing um, psychiatry and there were psychiatrists there were psychiatrists in the uh, French Revolution for example um, and the um, and and people would be discussing them their, their lives and their thoughts and their problems um, and hoping to be healed by talking. So that's a, a way of putting our feelings and our life into words um, was, was extremely common in the 1800s and, 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 and being experimental with that. And we also see that in religious spheres. So um, not only Catholic religion, which has obviously got a very long history of, um, of confession, um, but also uh, Protestant forms of um, religion um, would be extremely interested in uh, writing diaries, and, and speaking your sins or speaking what your life should be and the difference between um, what it is and what it should be. That's a typical Protestant expression um, of the 1800s. And tolerance in general. Um, uh, there is a growing realization that, um, that it, it, there's no point in locking um, weird individuals up or people that we don't accept up, but when they're um, that's just expensive to have those institutions um, going. So we need to find other ways of accepting all kinds of individuals in society. So, so whether that be uh, talking through our um, ourselves um, or, or 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 practicing a very individual religion um, or tolerating various kinds of human being, the techniques of the individual, um, self, early self help techniques, if you like, and mysticism and spirituality, we're all developing. Um, fast and experimentally in the 1800s. In, um, in the political sphere, we can talk about the um, development of governmental techniques. And here I'm using the word governmental to refer to one of the three branches of the state. We're familiar with the parliament, um, which makes laws, and the judiciary, which tests and applies laws. Uh, and in between, you've got the executive branch, uh, which I would call governmental. Um, in the American system, Congress applies to the parliamental um, parliamentary system and high court um, applies to the judiciary and the president himself is, is the governmental. And in the 1800s there are lots of governmental techniques that develop. Uh, we've already talked about the um, avalanche of printed numbers in the form of gathering statistics and, and developing statistics. Um, but also we've also talked about institutional experimentation, different kinds of institutions were being established, um, whether that be private institutions like um, insurance, um, or public institutions like various kinds of hospital and various kinds of schools, and um, and 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 in particular the development of uh, regional police forces. Um, that uh, you see, I have this between law and order here. Um, towards the end of the 1800s, police resembles what we would recognise today um, as a police force, which aren't purely to do with. Um, keeping the order in the streets so that people won't and aren't able to commit crimes, but also the kind the, the following up of exi existing criminals in order to prepare them for um, judicial treatment. 
Um, hence the TV series Law and Order, where they um, show both the um, the police action on the streets, but also the lawyers in the courts who are then going to prosecute these criminals. Um, the police are involved in both of those um, practices towards the end of the 1800s, whereas that was less the case um, for the people who were keeping order in the centuries previous. So institutions, policing, statistics, all of those things are um, ways that governments try to produce a society where there, where there is less crime. Um, even though it is, there is an understanding that um, the crime rates are constants and, and illness rates are constants according to the laws of big numbers which are developed in the 1800s. Um, at the same time, um, there, is, there are governmental ways of just dealing with these facts of human nature um, with, these, with these three ways going forward. And then the question is, what do these two have to do with each other? Well, very little as it happens. We kind of don't like it when, uh, when governmental institutions or governmental power um, takes place in what we consider to be um, an individual um, matter. So, for example, my individual conversation with my doctor about my very personal health um, should have been nothing to do with the police. And if the doctor turns out to have the police on speed dial, then I'm maybe not going to that doctor. We like to, con to, to make it a very strict um, division between the governmental and the personal. And libertarianism, um, where the government is, uh, where, where we are protected from government intervention, was an invention of the 1800s. And so we notice that where these two do meet each other, for example, in spheres like criminal psychiatry, religious schools, uh, policing religion and policing health. Um, it's a flashpoint. It makes us uncomfortable. But at the same time, we have to admit that they do speak the same language, however much we try to divide them from each other. And they produce the same kind of public sphere. They, both they are both contributing to what we live in with the society that we inhabit. More importantly, perhaps, uh, they, they sometimes and very often have the same ideals um, and um, sometimes the same scales of perhaps normality or scales of health. And schools are stuck in between these two. And so we need to think about both of those things if we're going to think about schools. So we've got two completely unrelated spheres of activity, but their combination is worth thinking about. Um, schools are affected by these practices of the individuals. Uh, psychiatry, reflection over oneself, self-help, my own identity, all of those things are, are concerns of the school. But at the same time, uh, national curricula, um, health, um, health, public health care, I mean, um, statistics and welfare and epidemiology, um, as we've seen this year, um, are something that schools have to relate to. And I think that if we think a little bit more about where these two concerns unite and meet each other, we'll see what kind of individuals the state might want and tolerate, and also what kind of power we, as tolerant individuals, may learn to and have to accept.